Luke chapter 17, Gospel of Luke chapter 17. And uh, what we're noting now in the uh, third section of the Gospel of Luke in chapter 17 uh, is a, a discussion in regard to service and the type of service that we're supposed to have uh, as members of the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And as we uh, uh, noted this and bege- excuse me, began this on Thursday night, I'm going to finish it up uh, tonight with the verse, or this morning with verses 9 and 10. But I found it very interesting, uh, especially uh, with Barry coming and uh, talking about the finances and all that's going on and the whole uh, congregation-pastor relationship. If you heard Thursday's message, again, that was not planned, okay? Uh, We've had uh, a Sunday canceled. We've had a Tuesday canceled. Barry was supposed to do this presentation probably a week or two ago. And, but for whatever reason, it all just kind of came together right now. And <laughs> I think that's the Holy Spirit trying to talk to us a little bit about us, uh, about what's going on. But in any case, um, what we've been talking about and what we noted on uh, uh, Thursday night was the relationship uh, between, as we see in this parable, we'll read this in just a minute, between a slave and its master. Uh, but ultimately, when we looked at the Greek, we understand that the slave is the pastor teacher and the master is the congregation. And the, and the relationship that we should have one to the other, the responsibilities for the pastor, the responsibilities then in reciprocation of the master as well. So we'll get into that a, a little bit more, but let's uh, uh, just read the uh, parable in itself, and then we'll get into the various uh, principles and lessons. But as I've also uh, noted, all of these are in regard to general service. Even though we have an object lesson, a pastor teacher, congregation. It's really talking to all of us about our service unto our Lord, our true master, who is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and God the Father, as you know. All right, so let's look at Luke chapter 17, now in verse 7. It says, But which of you, having a slave, plowing or tending sheep? And both of those Greek words, the plowing and also the tending the sheep, are words that are used for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, but also for pastor teachers uh, throughout the rest of the New Testament. So, and again, the second one, a, herd, a sheep herder, you can understand that, okay, tending sheep. Okay, so, but which of you, having a slave plowing or tending sheep, will say to him, when he has come in from the field, come immediately and sit down to eat? And this is a, a kind of a rhetorical question, but also se- uh, giving us the idea, no, this is not what you would do. The slave would not come in and eat first before his master. Now in verse 8 it says, But will he not say to him, Prepare something for me to eat, and properly clothe yourself, and serve me until I have eaten and drunk, and afterwards you will eat and drink. You see, that was the proper relationship between the servant and its master. And in this we see that it's the proper relationship between the pastor teacher and a congregation. The pastor teacher is to go out and work in the field all day. Again, plowing through the word of God, recognizing uh, how the spirit is leading him to develop a message for his congregation. And then ultimately come in at night, as it were, on a Sunday morning like we're doing, and deliver that meal called the word of God, Bible doctrine, as he teaches them that word on a consistent basis. And he does that first. And the master receives that message first and foremost. But then we also see at the end, once the master has eaten, in other words, once the congregation has been fed the food of the word of God, then they uh, provide for the servant, in this case, the pastor teacher, to now be able to eat as well. And also for that servant to be out plowing in the field in the day, he needed provisions by the master to provide for him so that he could go out and do those things during the day that are really preparing for the master, and it's all part of the master's estate. It's really all about the master, or in this case, the congregation. And that should be the mental attitude that the pastor has. It's not about himself and what he's going to get. Even if he works a long, hard day, it's not about the meal that he's going to have at the end of the day. It's about what? Serving the master because that's the job that he has to do. And ultimately, all of us are servants in one realm or the other, especially of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and all of us have to have that same attitude. It's all about serving other people. It's what we do with our time, our talent, our treasure, and specifically our spiritual gift 
so that we can serve other members of the body of Christ because they should be looked at as our masters. These are the ones we are here to serve. Other people, those who are lost and dying in the world that don't have salvation, our job is to serve them the gospel of Jesus Christ. For the believer in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our job is to serve them the word of God so that they can learn the principles and precepts. And even though it's the pastor teacher who's the mouthpiece teaching that word of God, it's really collectively we all come together with our spiritual gifts to support our church and to work within our church and outside of the church so that that word can go forward so that everyone gets to eat the mind of Jesus Christ or the word of God as it were. So we all have to work together. And it's not just about the pastor teacher and him speaking because, again, I can get up here and speak all day, but come on in. But ultimately, if you aren't uh, supporting the pastor or supporting the church, then there would not be an opportunity for the pastor to be able to study and teach the way that he should be. He, would be, he sh wouldn't be able to do it diligently. He would have to go out and get another job or do something else to support himself and his family. But with all of that, ultimately, uh, the pastor teacher, if he is provided for, can care for you and get that word out more and more each and every day. So each and every one of us has a responsibility to support our local assembly so that ultimately the word of God can be fed to yourselves and then also to other people as well. And that's the important aspect of our service each and every day. And you may not see that. You may not see how your spe specific spiritual gift functions and operates in support of the deliverance of the word of God, but it does. And it's all working collectively. And again, as uh, we know throughout the scriptures, Jesus Christ said, you know, what would the uh, right hand say if the left hand wasn't working? What would the eye do if the mouth wasn't working? What would the foot do if the, you know, uh, the ear wasn't working or whatever the case may be? We all part of the body of Christ and we all have to work collectively so that ultimately the word of God can be delivered. And, it, and as the master provides for his servant, remember, what did the master receive? his meal first. And that's what you are doing too. You see, by providing for the servant, the pastor teacher, you're providing for yourself. You're providing the spiritual food that is the most important thing in your life for yourself by supporting the servant and, and uh, slave, in this case, the pastor teacher, in uh, the analogy. So really, it, you know, and again, without getting arrogant, it's all about you, okay? <laughs> it's all about you. You're the masters, and you get to dictate what you do and what you don't do. If you want to be fed well, then again, provide so that you can be fed well. But if you just want to, you know, eat by in your spiritual food, then eat by in your spiritual food. And don't support or don't provide, and ultimately just scrape by with a little bit of food of the Word of God that you may get on a daily basis. All right, so three themes that we are seeing in this parable, which is first and foremost, be a servant of God and be the servant of God that you are to be. You see, we're all servants of God. We're all royal priests. We're all royal ambassadors. And we have a role and responsibility that God wants us to play each and every day. And in that role and responsibility, we are serving God in a fantastic way. And we're providing for the greater good of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the truth of the word of God to be delivered to ourselves first and then also to other people. So at the same time, we also see that we should not fall into a, a role of self-righteous, legalistic arrogance for doing what we're supposed to do. And this is the other message that Jesus is giving us here, that basically it's saying, don't look for the pat on the back for the service that you're doing. You're just doing what you're supposed to do. And do the job that God has given you to do, and do it well. And don't do it looking for you know, accolades and praise and what we call that approbation lust. Don't do your work and service looking for the pat on the back. Do it out of a heart of love, a love for God, love for your fellow mankind, and ultimately serve on a consistent basis. So we'll see that as we go through. And then thirdly, we see the other message is that we shouldn't be doing our service looking for the reward. Now, as I've said to you and as I've taught before, especially in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we will be rewarded in the eternal state for doing the job that God has given to us to do while we're here on planet Earth. And there are fantastic rewards and blessings that are waiting for us in the eternal state. 
There are baseline blessings that we're going to receive just being a believer when we get there. But then there's the greater grace blessings that God has given to us as he describes it as gold, silver, and precious gems. But it's not going to be those things. We're not going to care about gold, silver, and precious gems in the eternal state. But we're going to have power and authority and rulership in the eternal state and other great roles and responsibilities that God is going to give to us and great blessings. And maybe even some form of abilities in the eternal state that we otherwise would not have uh, if we weren't glorifying God uh, here on earth. And remember, as uh, 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 the book of uh, 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 First Corinthians, chapter 15, talks about the resurrection body. And remember how it says, star will differ from star. And some will shine bright as the sun in the eternal state. Others will be a tiny little speck that you can only see on a certain night if all conditions are right. Because there's not much glory reflecting from that individual because they didn't do their servanthood here on planet Earth. So this is what we're also recognizing. We don't do it for the reward. We know we are going to get rewarded in the eternal state if we do those things, but we don't have that as our motivation. Our motivation is love. Uh, righteousness, justice, and just a heart of gratitude for what God has done for us. And now we give that back to other people as we serve them on a consistent basis. So as we've noted already in verse 7 uh, and 8, remember the, the uh, slave who is plowing and tending is in this, the object lesson of the pastor teacher. That is the object lesson, and as I've already said, the master here is the congregation. We all have a role and responsibility in regard to our servanthood. You have yours, I have mine. And the pastor teacher in this object lesson needs to serve first before any of his needs get met. And the same thing uh, should be for you as well. And when you go out in your servanthood, it's not about what you're going to get in return, but it's about the service that you are designed to provide with your spiritual gift, time, talent, and treasure that God has given to you. Utilize those things to serve God in a fantastic way. And again, worry about your daily needs on the back end, or I should say, don't worry about your daily needs on the back end, because they will be provided by our God who is in heaven. So even though it's, again, directed with the object lesson, lesson of a pastor, teacher, and a congregation, it's really talking about each and every one of us. We all have a servanthood responsibility. The Greek word there, as you know, is the Greek word doulos. We're all servants of God. Then in verse 8, as we've already noted, the servant prepares the food for the master first. Again, not vice versa or, or the other way around. The pastor teacher prepared, prepares the food, the spiritual food that you need to have on a consistent basis. He does that. He is to do that well. And then he provides that to you. As a result, once you have eaten the word of God, uh, taken in the spiritual food, then there's the reciprocation of providing for the pastor teacher, as it were, just as we see here in verse 8. And as I said here, we also understand that the word in of itself to serve is the Greek word dikai koneo. And in that word, it is used also in the New Testament for the word deacon. That's where we get our, our office of deacon from, from this word. And this is a word that ultimately, in the Greek language, meant to wait on tables. We'd call that a waiter today. That's who the servant of God is. And think about the waiters that, uh, at, at the restaurant that you attend or uh, go to from time to time and how they're serving you the meal. You know, there's somebody in the background preparing the meal, and that meal gets together, and then they take it out uh, from the back, and they bring it to you, and they deliver it to you, and they put it down before you, and now you're there to dine. And if they're a good waiter, they're going to come back and say, they're going to follow up and say, can I get you anything else? Is everything good? Does it taste good? And again, a lot of waiters come back. How does it taste tonight? Does it taste well? Does it taste good? Okay. And I guess I should ask you, how's your meal taste today? How's the doctrine I'm giving you today? Does it taste good? Does it taste well? Is it okay? All right. Is there something else I need? You need a little salt, a little pepper, a little Parmesan cheese? Do you want to put that on it? All right. So again, they come back. There's follow up. There's you know, uh, you know, uh, throughout the meal, they're always attending to your needs. And that's how we need to be as servants of God as well. Especially if there's an unbeliever that you're trying to witness. Tend to their needs. Help them. Follow up with them. Come back to them. Don't just give them the gospel once and say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Okay, no. Follow up. 
Ask if they need help, if they need anything else. Do they need some salt and pepper? Do they need some cheese? Whatever the case, ask them those things. And don't let it just be a one time, here's your meal, now go and eat it, okay? As, uh, I don't want to make any jokes about some waitresses out there, but in any case, uh, here's your meal, go and eat it, okay? And don't bother me, I don't want to do anything else, all right? No, that's not how we are to be as servants unto our Lord. Again, we need to follow up, we need to minister, and we need to do it well. And do your job well. And your most important job, and again, all of you have a job, either in the home or outside the home, as a, a parent or as a grandparent or uh, whatever the case may be, a husband, a wife. We all have different jobs within society. But the most important job that all of us have been given is to be a servant unto our God. Again, we are royal priests, we are royal ambassadors, and we are to serve our fellow mankind as we serve God on a consistent basis. So, as I've said, and again, just in a uh, way of uh, summarization, that eating and drinking until you have eaten, until you have drunk, the, the, the servant is to make sure you have all that you are, uh, need and all that is necessary. And I found it interesting that that eating and drinking also goes along with the communion supper that our Lord gave to us, the bread and the wine. And again, next Sunday morning, we'll celebrate that. Uh, we'll celebrate the communion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We eat the bread, we drink the wine. There's eating, there's drinking. And we need to receive that. And we need to ultimately be delivered that uh, so that we can celebrate and have a great communion with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it's all about getting uh, fed the Word of God. The pastor is to feed you the Word of God. If, as I said on Thursday night, if the pastor is not feeding you the Word of God, you got to get rid of that guy or, or talk to that guy about getting you the Word of God and giving you the spiritual food that you uh, 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 need on a consistent basis. It's your responsibility as a congregation, and I should say all the congregations out there throughout the world and throughout the country. It's their responsibility to demand that they get fed. And that's what we also take away from this passage. And if the individual isn't doing it, get rid of that individual or go to another church and make sure you are getting fed the word of God that you are supposed to be fed according to God's plan. And as we also have is in the summarization, once the servant provides for the master, the master then provides for the servant. And that's where the congregation has to provide for their pastor teacher so that he can focus on all the meal that is necessary for you. He can dig through the word of God, study the word of God, and ultimately prepare the word of God and then teach you the word of God. But if he's distracted by other things in life, caring for his family and providing for them by going out and having to work somewhere else or do another job, he's not going to have the time to study and prepare the word uh, for you as otherwise is necessary. And so therefore, he won't be able to do a good job in preparing your meal on a consistent basis. So now we get into verses 9 and 10. That was all just summarization, okay, of what we've already noted. But now we get into verses 9 and 10, which we didn't know on Thursday night. And this is what I'm calling the Ray Almeida passages. Now, I know a lot of you know who Ray Almeida was, who's now home uh, with our Lord, passed away uh, several years ago. But he was the deacon at the church that I was ordained at, uh, myself and also my good friend, Pastor Bill Wenstrom, as well. And uh, uh, Deacon Ray Almeida was a kind of a rough and tough guy, and uh, Gary knows him well, and knew him well back in the day. Rough and tough and kind of a rumbly guy, you know. And, uh, but he, you know, told it like it is, you know, and he spoke plainly. He wasn't all about, you know, fluff and puff and trying to, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, 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 give you some storyline that is not true. It's kind of funny. The, I remember uh, the first time I went to the church that I was ordained at, uh, down in, I think it was back in Somerset that day. You know, I sat down, I, I think I went by myself that night, and sat down in the, in the pew and uh, basically was in the back. And, you know, uh, Ray was behind me. I didn't know him at the time then. Somebody else might have been with him. And uh, so uh, I turned around and I kind of said, you know, wanted to know a little bit about church. So say, what, what kind of church is this? And, you know, what do you, you kind of do there? You know, because I didn't really know anything about the church. I just knew there was a good Bible teaching church and that kind of stuff and whatnot. And Ray says, Oh, don't worry. You know, in about five minutes, we'll be up dancing on the tables and, you know, maybe throwing our clothes all over the place or something like that. <laughs> you know, or something like that. You know, so, but, you know, he had a great sense of humor, okay? But he was also like, you know, if you think you're going to come in here and do anything about this church, okay, you've got another thing coming, okay? 
basically, this is a good church. It's a Bible teaching church. And ultimately, we need to learn the word of God. And that's what we do. So, again, my first impression was Ray was like, oh, really? Okay, okay. I'll just be quiet. I'll just, I'm not going to say anything, okay? I'll just be quiet over here. But in any case, he was a, a wonderful guy. But, you know, where I call this the Ray Almeida uh, passage is after my good friend Pastor Bill Winstrom and I were ordained, ordained and before we had uh, local assemblies that we were teaching at at that point in time, he basically, uh, you know, we got together for, uh, uh, for some reason, I forget what it was, but I remember what he talked about and the wisdom that he gave, which is wisdom from the Word of God. And he was really talking about, in general, about how people serve within their church. And many people want the pat on the back. They want the accolades. Oh, I did this. Oh, I did that. And they want the, you know, hurrah, hooray for what they've done. And I think Ray was maybe using other people as an example for the attitude that Bill and I should have as pastor teachers as well. Because ultimately the phrase that he came up with is that you're only doing what you're supposed to do. And people, when they come into the church and they serve in the church and we're working within the church, ultimately we're only doing what we're supposed to do. And as it says here, what we ought to do. And this is what we ought to do. Serve one another. Serve our church. Again, especially as a pastor teacher, again, what I ought to do is serve you the meal of the word of God on a consistent basis. That's what I ought to do. And I shouldn't be looking for a pat on the back or an accolade and uh, you know, uh, I don't stand at the door when you all leave so you can say, oh, pass a good message. Oh, that was wonderful. Oh, this and that. You know, you just leave and I'm going that way, okay? <laughs> but no. <laughs> but again, you know, we're not here for our egos to be built up, okay? Yes, we will be built up by the Word of God in the positive exhortation that is the Word of God, but it's not about the ego and being puffed up with what we have done. We are just doing what we ought to do. And as the pastor teaches you on a consistent basis, he should be doing and have the attitude, I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. And as you then serve within the church and support the pastor teacher, you're just doing what you're supposed to do. And, and be good with that. Now, you know, within all of this, uh, you know, uh, we also have the principle of thanksgiving. And ultimately, we are doing what we are ought to do or what we're supposed to do. And we should not be looking for the thanks in this case. But I also want to remind you, remember, thanksgiving is a biblical principle. So even though we don't look for the thanks, that doesn't mean you don't give people thanks, okay? Because we ought to be thankful for the service that people give to us. We ought to be thankful for the camaraderie that we have. And we are always to be thankful in our God and what he has provided for us. So it doesn't mean you have to be cold-hearted individuals and never thank anybody for what they've done, okay? But that, because Thanksgiving is a biblical principle and being appreciative for what you have and what you've received is biblical principles. But the fact is the servant should not be looking for the thanksgiving, as it were, because they're just doing what they're supposed to be doing. And again, don't look at that in a negative realm either, because uh, we all have fantastic opportunity. And God has blessed us with a spiritual gift and with an effect in a ministry. God has blessed us to be able to serve inside of his family and while we're here on planet Earth. And as we know, and the result of our service, when we get to the eternal state, God is going to thank us for that. We've already seen the passages where Jesus is going to gird himself and then serve us in the eternal state in a form of thanksgiving, but also the blessings and rewards that we know are waiting for us in the eternal state. So with all of that, blessings, rewards, thanksgiving is not our motivation. That's all that God is saying here. Just do your job uh, unto the Lord on a daily basis, on a consistent basis, and let the thanks take care of themselves. There will be thanksgiving, but ultimately we don't do it for that motivation. Because there is a part of our sin nature that does look for what we call approbation lust. We want it to pat on the back. And unfortunately, many you know, religions and denominations within Christianity today, it's all about feeding that lust pattern of approbation. And that self-righteous arrogance, it's the Pharisees of Jesus' time, they were all about the accolades that they would receive, how people would receive their prayers. He says they would pray with many words, trying to impress people, because people say, oh, isn't that wonderful? Oh, isn't that nice? And that's what they wanted. Or they'd give more in the offering, and that's what they wanted. 
And as Jesus said, they've received their reward in full. Okay? So if that's all you want, you're going to get it, but your reward is in full. Rather, don't have that as your motivation. Serve unto your Lord out of a heart of love and let the thanksgiving be taken care of itself. And ultimately, there will be even greater blessing, not only in time, but in the eternal state. But again, that's not our motivation. So we serve from a heart of servanthood, a heart of love. That's what we ought to do on a daily basis, just because we love God and we love the word of God. We love the mind of Christ and we love our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And therefore, we want to do these things in reciprocation of the love that he has already poured out onto us. And this type of service is only what is reasonably expected of us to do. Now, remember the context of all of this. Back in verses 1 through 4, we talked about forgiving our brother who sins against us and asks for our forgiveness, repents, in, as it were, and changes his mode of operation. And if he does that, and as we see in the Gospel of Matthew, 490 times a day, we are to forgive them. And so the context for all of this is that when you have a heart of forgiveness, which you should, don't think anything highly of yourself because you now have forgiven. And don't be looking for the accolades of forgiving other people. It's just what we're supposed to do. So that's the context of all of this in our servanthood of forgiving our fellow brothers and sisters for the sins that they might have committed against us. That's what we are to do. And we do it out of love, not because we think we're going to get something out of it, like a pat on the back or you know, greasing our palms with some money or whatever the case may be. So the mandate here uh, you know, from our master, who is God, is to not to expect to be thanked for the service we performed even after a long, hard day. And again, you know, uh, sometimes we feel this in the human realm. You know, you work hard, you, you, know, you go to a job, or you're with the kids all day, and it's just been a h long, hard day. And then the husband comes home or the wife comes home and whatever, and then there's no thanksgiving one to the other and that. Sometimes people get mad or angry because of that. Well, why didn't you thank me after the long, hard day? Why didn't you do this for me after the long, hard day? Well, sorry to tell you, folks, but you just did what you're supposed to do. And that's it. And there really shouldn't be thanks, or you shouldn't be looking for the thanks. Okay? It's just what you were supposed to do. But husbands, wives... Do be thankful for your husbands and wives and what they do on a daily basis or, you know, your family and friends and what they've done for you. Yes, we ought to be thankful and we ought to encourage people. But again, don't let your emotions go ebb and flow because you got thanked or you didn't get thanked. You got thanked, you didn't get thanked. No, be that even keel person who just has the happiness of God in their soul even after a long, hard day that went unthanked. See, that's the better mode of operation rather the ebb and flow of emotionalism that can be within our lives. So, again, uh, you know, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer about these things, okay? That's not what this is all about, but it's about our mental attitude and serving unto the Lord and doing our job as a husband or as a wife or, a, uh, uh, or even as a worker on the job. Doing our job unto the Lord as we should. And again, not looking for the approbation that uh, uh, comes along with it. Actually, let me go back uh, uh, to this. So whether we're a pastor, a deacon, a missionary, or an evangelist, somebody that is preaching and teaching the Word of God, that's what we are to do. Preach and teach the Word of God. And oh, by the way, you are a royal ambassador, you're a royal priest, and ultimately you need to deliver the Word of God to those in your periphery, your family, your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers. Okay? We have a responsibility. And we do that unto the Lord, not looking to be thanked in the situation or not doing it because of the reward. We do it because we're supposed to do it, but we do it out of heart of love. Because we don't want somebody spending eternity in a lake of fire. We don't want a believer living back in a sinful life, living in the gutter of sin. We want to raise them up and encourage them and strengthen them and have them go forward in the word of God and spend eternity with God in a fantastic way. That's our heart that we need to have, not what we're going to get out of it, but the love we have for other people. So, again, uh, let's turn to Ephesians chapter uh, 5 real quick. Actually, we're just going to uh, look at uh, chapter 6. But uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, all the way through uh, chapter 6, verse 9, 
we see uh, good instruction from our Lord. And again, at the uh, end of chapter 5, it's first about how husbands are to love their wives and how lives are, uh, wives are to respect their husbands. And so again, you can go back and read that on your own. And then uh, when we look at uh, chapter 6 and verse 1 and, uh, through 4, we see the relationship between uh, fathers and their children and how they should uh, uh, operate and uh, reciprocate one to the other and the roles and responsibilities. But now in verse 5, when we talk about slaves, again, we have the doulos here again. And that's what we're talking about in the parable in Luke chapter 17. So slaves, we could say workers or servants. It says, be obedient to those who are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in sincerity of your heart as to Christ, and not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. That's what it's all about. Do the will of God from the heart. And then in verse 7, with good render service as to the Lord and not to men knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And masters do uh, the same to them. And give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. So again, we see the role between the, uh, the boss and the worker, as it were, or the slave and the master, uh, as we have analogy. But recognizing that we do our jobs unto the Lord, and that's our great motivation. Do our jobs unto the Lord, not as I pleasers or men pleasers or whatever that phraseology uh, that, that you like. Whatever that is, you're not doing it to get approbation or a thank from them, but you're doing it because you're a servant unto the Lord. And you're doing your job unto the Lord, as it were. So we can take that right into our homes as uh, parents uh, taking care of children every day. We can take it right into the office as we, or online as we have it. Uh, many uh, less offices these days, but you can take it right to the work and the work site and have it in that relationship as well. We don't do things trying to please man, as it were, but we do it unto the Lord. And I guarantee you, if you do it unto the Lord, it's going to please mankind as well. But we're not looking for the approbation and the lust of that uh, thanksgiving or pat on the back, as it were. Now, as we look at verse 10, let's go back to uh, Luke chapter 17. And in Luke chapter 17, verse 10, it says once again, it says, For you too, when you do all the things which are commanded you, say, we are unworthy slaves. And we have only done that which we ought to have done. And that should be the attitude that we have. Again, the unworthy slave, and we've only done what we are supposed to do. So within this, what we're talking about is having a humble heart as well. And in humility, again, not that we are humiliated, but in humility and a humble heart. We are here to serve other people. We're not here to serve ourselves. Again, was the slave there to serve himself? No, he was there to serve the master. Is the pastor teacher there to serve himself? No, he is there to serve the congregation. And each and every one of us, we are here to serve our God and with that serve our fellow mankind, not looking for the approbation as it were. And at the same time, you know, you don't have an attitude of saying I'm worthless. You know, saying I am unworthy does not mean that you are worthless. That's not what you're to do. You're not to get hypersensitive in uh, the role and responsibility that you have. And you don't think that I'm a good for nothing. Okay? You don't have that attitude either. Again, don't beat yourself up and don't tear yourself down in that realm. That's not what this is all about, saying, I'm unworthy or I'm a good for nothing. Okay? No. What we are to do is to say, I have, I have a humble heart, and I'm not here to serve myself, but I'm here to serve my God and other people. That's what the attitude is that we are to have as servants unto our Lord, not looking for the honor or praise uh, from people, and certainly not for God either, even though you know you're going to get it from God. We do it from a humble heart. And again, they should not do it, uh, excuse me, we should all do this out of a heart of love, where we love our neighbor as we love ourselves, and we even take it a step further. Love one another as Christ loved us as he laid down his life on our behalf. 
And we too should have that attitude. Lay down your life on behalf of those that you're serving. And the pastor teacher needs to lay down his life so that he can serve you. And then ultimately you need to lay down your life so that you can provide and serve your pastor teacher as well uh, by providing for his needs. So it's all about the sense of duty that we are commanded to have. This is what I am ought to do, or what I ought to do. This is what I'm supposed to do. And have that heart as we go forward inside the plan of God. And certainly, we should never, especially the pastors we see in these passages, I'll show you those in just a second, we do not do it for the profit that we can make. Okay? I know there's a lot of pastors out there, and there's a lot of guys on TV, and I call them shysters, as it were. They're all about money, 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 and so you see the faith, and, you know, so, 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 so. Okay? And they guilt you into it, and they, you know, con you into it. And they just want more and more money, and money, and money, and money. And sometimes I ask myself, I scratch my head and say, you know, don't you have, you know, a jet that you're flying around in all the time anyway? How much more money do you need? Don't you already live in a mansion? How much money do you need? And again, our, pre our previous president was a rich, rich man. And he did a job for our country without taking the salary. Okay? Many of these pastor teachers have more than enough money. They should probably be doing it without taking the salary. Okay? You would think. And just take all that money and give it to the people that need it. Okay? So... In any case, I digress. But in 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, verse 8, and these other passages, like 1 Timothy 5, 2, it says, Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. Again, we don't do our service for the profit that we could get from it. We do it out of eagerness because we love one another, and it's just what we should do, and we want to do it because we have a heart for people and the word of God. In Titus chapter 1, verse 7, for the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, again, he doesn't like to get in fights all the time, it's okay, and then not fond of sordid gain. So again, not for the money that you could get from it. Now we see also in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8, deacons, Likewise, must be men of dignity, not double-tongued or addicted to much wine or of sordid gain or fond of sordid gain. So even the deacon shouldn't be in it for the money, but out of a heart of service. And then in regard to false teachers of false doctrines, it says they must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of what? Sordid gain. Many of the false teachers or false doctrines that we see in our generation and throughout society today, they're just in it for the money. And they're doing it to tickle people's ears so that ultimately they will give, 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 and give more. And they're doing it out of the gain and not out of a heart of love to teach them the Word of God. That's what the pastor's here to do. Teach the Word of God so that ultimately the soul of every member of the congregation is filled up with that Word of God, the mind of Christ, so that they can go forward in the plan of God with a better relationship than they otherwise would have. So the attitude of the servant, again, should be we have only done what we ought to have done. That should be our attitude. And not looking for, you know, grandiose uh, pats on the back or any, you know, thanksgiving uh, from other people. And again, as I said, nothing wrong with giving thanks. Biblical principle of giving thanks. But our attitude, our motivation is not for that. It's not for the thanksgiving and uh, all that we can gain from it, but it's only doing what we ought to do. And have a sense of duty. You know, there are many people that don't have a sense of duty in our society any longer, especially in regard to our nation. You know, they just want to take, take, take from the nation, okay? They don't want to have a sense of duty of giving back to the nation. Uh, and again, to get a little personal, again, my dad, who passed away this past year, and his birthday is next uh, Sunday, was a great man of duty and a great man of giving back. I mean, he was on, you know, a, a, an organization called the JCs that, you know, barely exists anymore today. And they just did community service. You know, he uh, was superintendent of our first church and o oversaw the prep school and the Sunday schools that were there. He was on the school committee. He was a selectman. Uh, uh, he was a deacon then at the uh, church that I was ordained at. And then he became a deacon at our church as well. Again, he had a heart of service and duty. Uh, he was in the army. He, uh, you know, volunteered for that. He was patriotic, okay? He gave back.
back. He served other people throughout his entire life. Okay? He just had that sense of duty to do that. He wasn't doing it, you know, to get a pat on the back or for the sword gain that he could get from it. He didn't make any money from doing all those things. Okay? But he just did it because he thought he ought to do it. And that's the attitude that we need to have in our country today and certainly within our churches today. We ought to do it. But many people are just looking, what can I get out of it? What can I take, 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 take? And it's all about the taking. And it's not about what can I give and how can I serve and that I should have a sense of duty in my service to my country and certainly, uh, first and foremost, to my God. Now, in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, for if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for I am under compulsion. But woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. This is what Paul's attitude was. I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. And I'm under compulsion to do this because God has given me a spiritual gift. He's saved me from the eternal lake of fire. He has given me great grace blessings and uh, opportunity and responsibility. This is what I am supposed to do. And I'm not under compulsion, uh, for I am under compulsion in that sense. And again, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Woe is me if I do not do what I'm supposed to do. And again, that should be the attitude of every servant. Woe is me if I don't do the service that God has given me to do. Woe is me if I don't use my spiritual gift, if I don't use the time, the talent, and the treasure that God has given to me to, again, serve, and especially serve the body of Christ. So as uh, I said earlier, too, in the context of all of this, it has to do with having a heart of forgiveness. And in this object lesson that our Lord is giving to us, you know, we are all to be forgiving of our fellow mankind. Again, we don't hold grudges. We don't, uh, you know, hold uh, past sins against people. And as I went through this, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, over the past week or so, remember, first we forgive them in the mentality of our soul, whether they ask for it or not. You don't let that sin, uh, you know, become, uh, you know, a further sin within your soul whether you are angry and bitter and have revenge motivation and now want to lash out. You forgive them mentally. And then if they come back and ask for forgiveness and repent, stop doing what they were doing to you in that sinful way, again, now you experientially forgive them and you can enter back into that relationship with them and act as if the sin never happened. And that's how we should ought to act and function and operate. And in doing that, we don't puff ourselves up and say, oh, look what I did. I forgave everybody. And, oh, I did this and I did that. And, da, da, da. and you should be thanking me for this. No, we just do it because we're supposed to do it. We forgive because we are supposed to give. forgive. God uh, forgave us by sending his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Why? Because that was his obligation, to forgive us of our sins. And he had to find a way. You know, God created mankind, and he knew Satan would come in and mess things up and throw sin into the mix which brings about spiritual death and a lack of relationship with God. God then had an obligation to do something about that. And he did the best thing he possibly could do by sending his son to die for our sins and give us a pardon when we would believe upon him for the forgiveness of our sins. He was under obligation. Now, he wasn't looking for great accolades. When Jesus Christ came, he said, I haven't come to establish a kingdom and put me on a throne here. I've come to serve by going to the cross and paying the penalty uh, for the sins of mankind. You see, he had that attitude of duty. And he had the sense of what he ought to do. And he did it. God the Father did it. God the Son did it. And God the Holy Spirit did it. So ultimately, uh, we could all have salvation. And so that God uh, could also rectify the problem of sin being in the world. And again, uh, nothing that we ought to boast about but we're only doing what we, we ought to do. So, therefore, when we do godly works, when we live the faith rest life, and again, remember after forgiving, it talked about having faith like a mustard seed and the accomplishments we could have if we had faith like a mustard seed, which just means a little bit of faith to apply. You don't need more faith. You just apply the faith you have. Again, we don't look for accolades, and when we do the godly works, when we have that faith rest, uh, faith rest life, we don't expect to receive any accommodations from that. We just do it because we're supposed to do it. We're only me merely doing the job that God has given us to do. And again, as I uh, quoted last week, uh, Pastor Bill, uh, Pastor, um, Coach Bill Belichick, okay, you just 
do your job. Okay? And that's what we're here to do. We're all professional Christians. And we ought to do our job and do it unto the Lord and serve. And not be looking for the accolades that come along with it uh, as a result. So good works are our duty. We do not place God in our debt. It's interesting. There's a Greek word. I'll give it to you in the notes. When it says, do not be looking for, you know, the thanksgiving in all of this, it says, really, the word is indebted. It says, don't put God in debt to you. Don't have the attitude that God is indebted to you to reciprocate the service that you have done. Again, just do it because you're supposed to do it. So again, when we have any type of mental attitude of, I want praise, I want thanksgiving, I want rewards and blessings of the eternal state, and if I do this, God uh, has to do this for me, no, we're putting God indebted to us for the good works and service that we perform. And that should never be our attitude. God should never be indebted to us. Instead, we have the wholehearted devotion to him. We have a wholehearted devotion to one another. And we have it from an attitude of love in our soul, recognizing this is what I ought to do. And as a result of all that I've been blessed with, this is what I need to do for my fellow mankind as well. And just go out and do it. Just go out and serve, and serve in a fantastic way. And then let the chips fall where they may about rewards and blessings in the eternal state. But just do it because you have a duty to do so. And do it out of love. So uh, that's what our Lord is trying to teach here in this uh, great parable. Let's just uh, read it once again And uh, now that we see it all. In verse 7 it says, But which of you, having a slave plowing or tending sheep, will say to him, when he has come in from the field, come immediately and sit down and eat. Again, rhetorical question. You would not do that. But will, this is what you would say, but will he not say to him, prepare something for me to eat and properly clothe yourself and serve me until I have eaten and drunk, and afterwards you will eat and drink. He does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? And the question, rhetorical question, response is No. And then so in verse 10, it says, So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded you, say, We are unworthy slaves and have done only that which we ought to have done. And so therefore we go forward with that mental attitude, which again is a much bet better attitude because it's not with the ebbs and flows of the emotional you know, uplifting of thanks or down uh, you know, a, a spiral of not being thanked. It's the even keel having the spiritual life and maintaining the happiness of God in your life in all that you do. All right, so let's uh, uh, close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the great examples and object lessons in regard to our servanthood and giving us the great servant of all time, uh, your son, Jesus Christ, and him being a model within our life. And Father, just help us to emulate him more and more each and every day as we learn more of his uh, uh, thinking and thoughts through your word that we too can serve and glorify you. So Father, we thank you for this time and we ask that you be with the closing portions of our service. In Christ's name, amen. All right, thank you very much for that portion of our service. And now we're going to have Deacon Barry come forward and uh, we'll partake of an offering. Okay, let us uh, pray for our offering. Lord, we pray that you bless our gracious and generous givers in all that we are able to give in today's offering, that we may continue to meet our financial obligations. In your word, the truth will continue to be taught from this pulpit. Through Christ we pray with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.